Good evening, this lecture is Be'ezrat Hashem Le'ilui Nishmat Shai Li'ael Bat Moran, Daniel Ben Natan, Roda Bat Natan, Arthur Ben Avram Avinu. And Le'avdi, Le'refuat, David Ben Helena, Matatov, Esther Bat Naomi, Ruven Ben Sara. Before we get into the topic, Baruch Hashem, uh, as you can see, the summer is here. And uh, the Yetzirah is growing. And we need to have extra caution now walking on the street. As the summertime always brings a lot of nisyonot, a lot of tests. Today, before I start the lecture, I heard a story today that I, it's hard for me to believe that such a thing is possible. I've always uh, been telling you over the years that the Torah said that you have to know who to help. Not everyone you're allowed to help. Big criminals that go against Hashem, when you come and help them, it makes you a partner to the crime. So obviously that's not the right thing to do. Or people that are ungrateful. You know the more you help them, the more they get, they get upset with you. The more they stick the knife back in your back. Why? Some people, when you help them, instead of appreciate it, they get jealous that you are able to help and they are the needy ones. Instead of appreciating, the more you help them, the more they develop some kind of a grouch against you. You ask yourself, how can it be? Sometimes I ask myself also, how can it be? Let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. There's a woman who works for a boss in a company that needed a, a kidney transplant. Otherwise, he'll die. He needs someone to donate a kidney to him. She is only an employee. She felt bad for her boss. She decided to donate a kidney to him and save his life. So she went under the operation as they remove her kidney and transplanting the, t the kidney to the boss, it takes few weeks for her to recover from the surgery. He recovered faster and came back to work while she was still recuperating from the surgery. Guess what? He didn't like the idea that it takes so long for her to recover and fired her. Did you ever hear such a story? Do you see what's going on in this world? People like this, it's mitzvah to help them? Where is the mitzvah? Maybe here she didn't know how ungrateful he can be, but if you know someone is an ungrateful person, the more you help him, the more he will turn against you. It's a famous story once they came to Gaon Mivilna, maybe it was the Chafetz Chaim, one of them. When they say somebody speaks against you in town, Lashon Ara everywhere. And the rabbi say, I'm sorry, but I don't remember ever doing a special favor to that person. Meaning what motivates him to be against me? I mean, if I would help him a lot, then I understand the Yetzer Ara, the Satan is trying to bury him deep. And that's the way it is. Usually, it's forgetfulness. In this case, with the kidney, there's nothing to forget. We're talking weeks. You can't forget who saved your life. But in general, sometimes you do a huge favor to someone and they just forget it. Just like many other things in life. Sometimes people choose what they want to remember and what they want to forget. Not necessarily from their countries, they sometimes choose from their subconscious. Meaning because of their nature as ungrateful people, when people do favors to them because it's so not important in their eyes and they don't appreciate it very fast, they even forget it completely. So if you come here later and say, but why are you going against that person? He saved your life or he helped you or he inspired you, or, you know, whatever the case was, he doesn't even remember it or he barely remembers it. And because he doesn't remember it, there's no shame involved. And once there's no shame involved, 
There's nothing to hold a person from committing a sin. So here is a, is a perfect example. I thought maybe I should start the lecture with it because in reality, unfortunately, it, re it relates to every one of us how ungrateful we are to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. How much he does for us and we forget him. How much he's keep doing for us and we forget him. Sometimes we forget him within the act. As he saves your life, you forget him. You know, it doesn't even take a minute. You know, the famous joke that I was once uh, telling, that a person had a meeting in Manhattan, he had to be there by nine. The, the buyers are waiting for him in the office and he has to find parking. And he's very nervous, it's hard to find parking in downtown Manhattan by Wall Street over there. And he said, dear God, I promise you, i make a deal with you. If you find me a parking before nine, from now on, I'm going to start putting tefillin every day. I know I've been, uh, you know, neglecting the mitzvah of tefillin. I'll, I'll offer you a deal. Find me parking, and I'll put tefillin every day. Before I even finish the sentence, someone just pull out, and he said, it's okay, I managed. I, I, I managed by myself. This is the way we are. I mean, we laugh, but this is the way we are. One of the ways to handle such a bad trait, such horrible personality of being ungrateful and forgetting the good that people do for you, especially Hashem, is to learn about how horrible it is in the eyes of God, people that are ungrateful. How much Hashem hates ungrateful people. One of the best examples in the Torah is Ammon and Moab, two nations that Hashem say they can never convert. Why? Because when you came out of Egypt, all they had to do is to offer you some water and some bread, which will cost them almost nothing. Why? As appreciation that your grand-grandfather, Avraham Avinu, Abraham, saved their grand-grandfather, Lot, his nephew, saved his life, saved him from the prison, was captured by the kings, by the goyim. Avraham went to a war, risked his life, saved his nephew Lot, and Lot later on started the two nations from his daughter, as we know the story described in the Torah. One nation was Ammon, the other nation is Moab. Generations later, now they are already a nation. They have many, many people, and the Jewish nation asked just to pass through them, and instead of offering them bread and water, they have no appreciation. And God say, even the Egyptians who murdered you, but they offered you for a while a place to live when you came out of, the, out of Israel, out of the starvation, and they gave you a piece of land named Goshen, Eretz Goshen, and you were able to live there for a while, and later on they started to be cruel to you and started to torture you. But for a while, they gave you food and a place to live, so as of appreciation to what they did to you before they turned to cruel people and started to kill you and, and uh, put you in some slavery camps. But for, those, for that period of time, you owe them an appreciation. So what are we going to do here, Hashem said? Pharaoh and his children, those who live in the same generation, when they actually started to torture you, they cannot convert. But from the third generation and on, they'll be able to convert. Meaning, they, it's not the fault of the grandchildren that they had a Nazi father and a Nazi grandfather. Those already can join the Jewish nation. Why? Because they are not ungrateful. Meaning, Ammon and Moab, it's in their nature. Not one of them thought maybe we should go and help the Jewish nation. After all, we have life thanks to them, thanks to their grandfather. This is an example of how much Hashem cannot tolerate ungratefulness. And there's hundreds of other examples. I actually have a whole lecture about it, about Kfuyei Tova, ungrateful people. It's not the topic tonight. In Israel, unfortunately, there was uh, the annual gay parade, meaning every year, unfortunately, when they do it, last year they couldn't do it because of COVID. Every year, unfortunately, the numbers are growing. They claim that there was 170,000 people in the parade. 
maybe they exaggerate. You know how the media likes to exaggerate when it's something they like. You know, if it would be something religious and there would be 170,000, they would say 30,000. The media. Why? They don't want anyone to think that religious people are popular and they brought so many people. If it's something that they like, something abomination, something against Hashem, against the Torah, and 30,000 people came, they're going to say 100. If, uh, if 70 came, they're going to say 170. So we don't really know the numbers, but we definitely know that it's one of the biggest tragedies you can imagine now. We're talking here at least 100,000. You cannot deny it. The line was huge. Streets full of people that chose a lifestyle of abomination to be sincere, severe, horrible criminals that rebel against God and the laws of nature, the nature and the laws of the world. Making a crime a way of life. People all people, unfortunately, almost with no exception to the rule, commit sins. We are people, we have evil inclination. We're not always strong enough. And sometimes we surrender to our desires. Especially when we don't learn Torah, we don't listen to lectures, we don't learn Musar, we become weak spiritually. Once you're weak, it's very easy to fall. If you're full of Torah daily, you're connected to Torah, you read, you listen, it's much harder to commit sins. Why? Because the Torah is a great antibiotic against the spiritual infection and against the, 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 the infatuations and against all these desires that the Satan puts in front of people. So the rule is very simple. The more Torah you learn, the less sins you commit. The less Torah you learn, the more sins you commit. People that don't ever learn Torah, their entire life is one huge sin, which is, you know, combining millions of little sins. Or, you know, it's a way of life. But most people, as many sins as they commit, do not want to declare themselves as criminal against the creator of the world. That I actually choose, that's my will, to declare that I am an enemy of God. Meaning I want my life to be a life that every second of my life will make God angry. Most people are not like that. But choosing to be a gay on the open, meaning the way they dress on the street, the way they behave, the things they put in their social media, all the dirty pictures, all the dirty behaving in public, all these parades, all this forcing it on children in the kindergarten already in Israel. In kindergarten. People did not reach six years old. They brainwashed them from such a young age. In some countries, from eight years old, they already speak to people about the changing their gender. If you feel you're a girl, we will help you to be a girl. We'll give you hormones. Eight years old, without consulting even with their parents. Can you believe such thing? Here in America, they do things like this. And in Israel, in Europe, in Europe, <laughs> Europe's supposed to be worse than Israel. I heard today from a lawyer that fight this thing in Israel that in Europe they ban it. They're not allowed to do this to eight years old. In Israel, it became Sodom. Sodom and Gomorrah. It's, it's not, we're not even talking about religion over here. We're talking about something that is definitely illegal to take a little child, innocent child, and brainwash him and keeps, keep telling him, it's okay if you want to be a girl. It's okay if, to a girl if you want to be a boy. It's okay, it's okay, it's okay. Obviously, the more you tell someone that he's not what he is, he's something else, that's what he's going to be. If you keep telling your child, you're moron, you're stupid, you're this, you're dumb, what do you think is going to happen? He will never have confidence in his life. If you keep telling a person you are like this, you are like this, you're ugly, you this, you that, what do you think is going to happen? He will be convinced that that's what he is. Words have power. Sometimes more than actions even. The damage they make, the scar that they make in the, in the soul of a person, in his heart, sometimes is uh, 
unreversible. There's no way to actually fix it. Or maybe it needs years of treatment and therapy and all that. I see so many messed up people that are talking to me on a daily basis. People that could have been angels and their parents messed up their life. Sometimes it's the parents, sometimes it's society messed up their life, sometimes it's the school. Somebody messed up their life. Many kids that were attacked by all kinds of lunatics and uh, lunatics and uh, pedophiles and people with horrible mouth and arrogant people and all kinds of things, or crazy parents, or very violent parents, messed up their life. It's crazy what's happening here. So now they decided to turn all the kids in the world to gays. That's, I don't know, that's some kind of an agenda by the liberals, by the lefties. Maybe they declare a war to destroy the world. I said on my uh, interview on television a week ago, and I spoke in Israel on, on the news. I was actually on the main news. You know, when they interviewed me to the article, they say you call this the gay sotim. Sotim in Hebrew means, sote means someone who went off the path. There's a path, there's the straight path, and you went off the path to the wrong exit or off the road or you, went, or you fell to the side. So that's the word sote. Sote means you went off the path. So, so they started to attack me, like in Israel it sounds like a bad word, like you call someone sote means he's mentally sick. That's how they describe it. So I said, I don't understand what's wrong with that word. If someone rebel against the law of nature, you know, and law of nature say that all wor the world has male and female everywhere you go. So if somebody decides to, to put all the male together and all the female together and wants to redesign the world against the will of the creator of the world, well, why not calling him a criminal? Before we even talking about Torah and the punishment that God will give this kind of people, which is our worst punishment you can imagine. We're not even getting to the religion aspect here. We're talking about the laws of nature here. There is a creator to the world. Most people believe there is a creator to the world. They see an organization here. Everything is designed. So therefore, they understand someone made that system here. And all two million species have male and female, and they are the only one who together can bring more children to the world, can continue the race. So these people declare a war against the existence of the world. So why not calling him Sote, that they're off the path of the norma? The problem is, of course they know I'm right. For a second they never thought I'm saying something that is not true. But they're such crook and such evil people that for them, they want to do something very dirty. They want to take the not normal and turn it into the normal and make the normal people become a minority. They are the crazy one. They are not advanced. They are not modern. They are dark. They are primitive. They are a danger to society. Why? Because they want the world to continue the way it was for thousands of years. Because they don't want any, to accept any modification of the world, they are crazy. They are a threat. There will be a time, already there is a time like this now in some places, that if you're going to say that you're not gay, they're going to look at you as an enemy of the society. Oh, wait, really? What, well, you normal? You have a woman? Wow, you're crazy? There will be time like this. If you remember 30, 40 years ago, Gays couldn't show their face in public. That's why they call it, came out of the closet, because all of them were in a closet, because they were so embarrassed or afraid that people will attack them verbally, physically, and take sanctions against them, because no one, regardless of religion, no one, even the secular people, no one could actually tolerate such behaving 30, 40 years ago. It was crazy. To, so if someone had that problem, he would make sure no one would know about it, not even his parents, from the shame. A generation later, it turned around. That now not only it became normal, it's like, whoa, you're, you're up to date. You're an upgraded version of humankind. 
So they claim that 170,000 people came out in that parade. And you know, when they come out in those parades, they on purpose want to come to Jerusalem, right next to the house of God, where the temple was, right to the place where 80, 90% of the people over there are extremely religious, you know, very religious, ultra-Orthodox, and they have a lot of yeshivot. So on purpose, they want to come there where their religious kids walk to school or coming back from school. And they want them actually to see all the naked people on trucks with the loud music, how they behave, with the terrible behaving. And on purpose, they want to, on purpose, they want to intimidate the righteous people. Why? You're not going to tell us what to do. You're not going to tell us what's right and wrong. There's only one problem. If they knew history, if they would review what happened when waves like this came to the world thousands of years ago, they were the people of Sodom. They decided to declare a war against the law of nature. The generation of the Babylonian Tower, they decided to make a building and go and fight against the Creator. Don't tell us what to do. The people in the time of the flood, what was their end? Every time society went completely off and decided to modify the rules of God and make it the law of the land, the new rules, ignoring his instructions, it brought a disaster to the world. One time, a flood, everybody died, eight people survived, millions died. One time, the Babylonian Tower, they all got punished. Some of them, Hashem, turns into monkeys. Maybe that's what confused some of the scientists, thinking that we came from the monkey. It's actually the other way around. Some monkeys came out of people. But regardless, and the other ones, and he changed the languages, and that's why we have so many languages today in the world, which is a curse. It would be a lot better if the whole world would have one language. Who needs 5,000 languages? That's a punishment to humanity. That now you have uh, 5,000 different uh, languages. I remember one time they wanted to translate my, my film Torah and Science to Chinese. Chinese. One person wanted to sponsor it. I asked him, wow, what's in, what's in your mind that you're now thinking about the Chinese before you're thinking about your own brothers and sisters? Let's do things that will affect Jews. In China, how many Jews do you have? He said to me, but think about it. There are two billion people in China. If a few hundred millions of them will watch it, or even tens of millions, and they would leave their idols, and they leave uh, Buddha, <coughs> excuse me, they leave Buddhism or Christianity or their atheism, which either way, it's a crime against God. Whether you're Christian, whether you're an atheist, whether you're Buddhist, Either way, it's a crime against God, against the truth of Hashem. We can turn tens of millions of people from idol worshippers or non-believers into righteous Gentiles for a few thousand dollars. So, okay, you want to pay for it? It's your money, let's do it. Every translator said to well, there's a problem. There is so many different dialects in China. What they understand in this place, they won't understand in another place, in another place. There's so many different dialects, just in China alone. In the end, you say, we say, you know what? If that's the case, why wasting this time and money? So it's just to show you how many different languages you have today in the world. This is all as a curse and a punishment after the Babylonian Tower, which was about 3,500 years ago. Until then, everybody spoke one language. Everyone. But from then on, Hashem bilbel fatam. Hashem mixed the languages of the world. Mamash, like hocus pocus. Boom, from now on, you speak a different language. And they speak a different language. And they speak a different language. And you can see that uh, you go to some countries, they don't speak a word of your language. Baruch Hashem, we have English. It's most people in the world at least communicates, you know, somewhat with English. And I remember when I was in Turkey in Istanbul, one time I made a stop there with a the flight. 
I, I, I wanted to ask the police people in Turkey, in Istanbul, people that work for the police, to ask them about the gate, if I have to go through security again, or I, or I don't need security. That's my, that was my question, because I saw that, the, that I have another security. I said to myself, why would I have to go and wait another hour online? Has to be a way to go without security. Now one of the Turkish people in Istanbul spoke English. Now one policeman went from one, another one, another one. Nobody knew what I wanted. Nothing. I don't know what, hello, I'm sorry, excuse me, gate, nothing. So you see that our country is that people don't even know English. So it's unbelievable. You go to some places, nobody knows what you want. It creates a lot of problems. You have to bring translators in a court. This, all this headache was, is, is as a result of criminals that decided to declare a war against God. And here we are. One other problem is Adam and Eve. Hashem said to them, everything is yours. I put you in the Garden of Eden. Enjoy life. The angel will serve you. All the animals are under your supervision. You have fruits, you have vegetables, you have everything you need. You don't have to worry about anything. You don't have to work just to enjoy life. Just don't touch from this tree. What do they do? Declare a war against Hashem. Right away. They don't even wait. Just created a few hours later, already committed a crime and rebel against God. What's the results of that? 5,782 years of suffering. Everybody suffers as results of male, women, women giving birth, screaming, suffering, nine months pregnancy, raising children. All of that is a, is a curse of that transaction as results of that, that sin. And a and man, all the work, all the headache, all the investments, all the, everything you have to go through until you bring food to the table, all of that as results of the first war was declared against God. And then in Sodom and Gomorrah, even today when you go to the court in Israel, every rapist or pedophile or everyone who took advantage sexually of someone else, they call it in a court, Maase Sdom, an act of Sodom, meaning they, the first people who wrote the constitution in Israel, or probably a hundred years ago or more, and all of them were traditional enough, knowing Torah enough, to know that something like this, it's so bad, and it's so much against morality, that it's an act of the people of Sodom. You have to be weakened to be gay, or to be a pedophile, or a rapist, or take advantage on people. So they call all of that, they fall into the category of an act of Sodom. Until 30, 40 years ago, if someone actually committed a, a, a crime, meaning with, this, with the same sex, there, would, there, would, there was punishment under the secular laws against these people, in America and in Israel. It was against the law of the land. Forget religion. So, as you can see, Sodom and Gomorrah, what, what happened? Hashem burned them all. All of them were burned. Hundreds of thousands of people, perhaps millions, who knows the number. They were all burned alive. Imagine this, fire falls from the sky like rain, big chunks of fire, and burns everything. Today, when you go to Israel, there is a place called Sodom on the way to Elat. You go to the north, towards Egypt. You go in a, uh, on the mountains of Sodom. It's all desert. And there is the place where Hashem burns all the wicked people. You can never grow anything there. It's so dry. It's, you see right away, this place once was burned. That's it. It's still there. There is a place in Babylon that the Torah said that after the Babylonian tower was destroyed, Hashem cursed that place that no one could ever build, rebuild over there. And no one ever built in that place for 3,500 years. It's still there, all destroyed. 3,500 years later, nobody ever rebuilt over there. Why? There's a curse on the place. So these kind of people, they continue with their desire, with a terrible ideology, they try to re redesign the world and modify the laws of nature. And in the end, all of us will go down the drain. 
question is why we, we, the religious people, or those who are traditional, who are against it, why they will go down with them? They're very much against it. It hurts them very much to see what they do. So why not only we suffer seeing what they're doing, we in the end is gonna, we're going to go down the drain with them? When Hashem will punish the, the nation of Israel, we will go down with them? The answer is yes. Why? Because we can, when, when you can rebuke and you didn't, and when you could have done more to stop such a thing and you didn't, you are held as guilty as they. I can give you hundreds of examples. I'll give you only one example. Moshe and Aaron. Hashem asked Moshe to speak to the rock and get water out of the rock because there was no water for the Jewish nation. He needed millions of gallons of water now to give them enough water for them, for their animals. You have to get water by a miracle out of a rock. So when Moshe came to the rock, all the Libras, the lefties, Datan and Aviram and all the other Reshaim, they all came and they say, oh yeah, you're a shepherd, you know that there's probably spring water right here. Let's see you getting us water from a different rock. If you say it's the act of God, prove to us that you can get us water from a different rock. Moshe thought, Hashem told me to get water out of this rock by speaking to the rock. But what good is going to be? They're all making fun already. It's not going to impress anyone. What's the big deal? I'll get the water from the other rock. For Hashem, it doesn't make a difference. Logical thinking. Moshe meant well. When he came to the next uh, rock, he changed from the instruction that God gave him. As results of that, when he spoke to the rock, nothing happened. And everybody started to laugh. One minute, it was a big chilul Hashem. Big embarrassment to the reputation of Hashem. What we call Chilul Hashem. Everybody was laughing, all the lefties, all the liberals, all the anti-God people. And Moshe, with his anger, hit the rock with a stick. And two drops came out. Two little drops came out. And then he hit it again, and then tons of water came out. And they were all silent. They were shocked. What? He actually did it. But it was already too late, because the minute everybody was laughing, and the minute of Chilul Hashem in front of millions of people, that's a serious crime. Even if you meant well, needless to say when you didn't mean well, Moshe meant well to improve the reputation of God in the eyes of these wicked people. Not to disprove. He meant well, and as a result of one minute, Chilul Hashem, he did not enter Israel. Hashem said, because you embarrassed me in May Meriva over there, you will not enter the Holy Land as it was planned that you should do. So that's the story. The question is why Aaron got punished. Aaron was not ordered to get water out of the rock. Aaron didn't do anything. And that's the problem. Aaron was standing there. And that's why when Moshe hit the rock for the first time, Aaron should have told him, what are you doing? Hashem said to speak to the rock, why are you hitting the rock? If Aaron would interfere now as his older brother and stop him from hitting the rock, then Aaron would save himself for rebuking Moshe. Because Aaron was quiet and Moshe hit the rock for the second time, Aaron got the same exact punishment as Moshe. Moshe committed the act, and Aaron was standing there and did not try to stop it. And as a result of that, Aaron got the full punishment of Moshe. That's one perfect example of two righteous people. Two righteous people meant well, gave their life for God. One little mistake they made, and they paid such a massive price. Now imagine what's going to be with us. We do Chilul Hashem on a daily basis because of our desire and selfishness, because of ignorance, because we don't come to learn. Therefore, we don't know what we're doing and how severe it is. So we are guilty of everything. We, don't, we cannot come and say, oh, I meant well. 
you, you cannot come and say I drive uh, like a maniac on the road, or I mean well. You, know, you can't say such thing. Or I dress terribly as a woman, not modest on the street, because I mean well. What do you mean well? You only create problem. Or, or I steal because I mean well. You can't really say it. Moshe meant well. Aaron meant well. It didn't help them. Miriam spoke Lashon Ara against Moshe, not because she didn't love him. She loved him. He was her younger brother. She was upset that he left his wife. He's not uh, having uh, intimacy with his wife. Moshe thought if the nation of Israel cannot touch their wife for three days, they have to get purified until they get the Torah. Me, that speaks to Hashem every day, needless to say that I have to separate from my wife, you know, when I speak to Hashem. And Miriam meant well. Miriam wanted to improve Moshe that he should go back to his wife because his wife is upset. She lost basically her husband. So she didn't want to hurt Moshe. She wanted to help him. And what happened to her? She got leprosy. She got punished. And she was isolated a week in jail. Separation. What does it mean jail? There was no jail. Everybody had to wait. Why Miriam is in, a, in an isolation, in quarantine. The Torah gives you an example of the most righteous people that wanted to do a good deed, but what came out of it was not perfect. I can't even say bad. Because in reality, when Moshe, in the end, got water out of the rock, mission was achieved. What difference does it make if he speaks to the rock or hit the rock? Either way, it's a miracle. And all these liberals, they were silent after they saw the miracle. So in the end, Moshe achieved the goal. But for the one minute, Chilul Hashem, he got such a punishment. Same thing Aaron for not stopping him. And Miriam wa wanted him to get back with his wife. And what happened? She also got punished. Now imagine all the people that do everything they can to hurt the religion, to hurt the laws, to modify the Torah, to fight holiness, to fight good rabbis that speaks the truth. What's going to happen to them for millions of years of suffering when they come to their trial? That's what I don't understand. So conclusion. 170,000 people showed up. That means there is a lot more. That was in Tel Aviv. Not everybody came. Some people walk. Some people live five hours away. Not everybody came. So if they had 170,000 gays over there, that means that there's at least half a million. Or maybe even 700,000. In a country that barely has 6 million Jews, you're talking more than 10% of population here. And the main problem is that they want to turn the laws of the land to the laws of Sodom. And because we are all silent, the religious people, and everybody cares only about himself, we're going to go down with them. It's just a matter of time. When Hashem will decide that an Iranian missile will fall on Tel Aviv and kill a million people, it will also kill religious people. It will kill also the rabbis of Tel Aviv. It will kill a lot of religious kids. Why? Why did we did not stop it? You may come and say, we don't have the power to stop it. They own the media. They're in the government now. They rule the police. They rule everything. All these Erev Rav, these wicked people, they rule everything. It's not true. If a million and a half people that care about religion, religious people will go out to the street for one week. One week demonstrations everywhere. One week from morning to night, all over Israel. Clog the traffic, screaming everywhere. They would think a million times before they show their face like this on the open. Right now they laugh in your face. <laughs> There's nothing you can do. And if one individual tried to speak, immediately, immediately they butchered him. Why? To make sure that others will never dare to open their mouth. Right? To the point that when I spoke against what they do, even some very religious people told me, you're not afraid. Why, why do you need this headache? Better you don't talk. They will arrest you when you go to Israel. Why do you need this headache? Better you be quiet. 
you can win against them. That's the general approach right now. Meaning, let them take over Israel, let them turn a million Jewish kids into Sotim and destroy us completely, and then, I don't know, and then if the Mashiach would even want to come, for who is he going to come? If all the children will become like this in the next generation, who exactly the Mashiach will come for? That's a serious problem. It's called Et Sarai Le'Yaakov, time of trouble for the nation of Jacob. The rest of the verse is Umimena Yivashea. Let's hope that we will have salvation from this horrible problem. Unfortunately, today there's no leaders anymore. The last leader I remember was Rav Uvadia Yosef. Once he passed, there's no leader that can affect two, three million people by one speech. There's no, there's no such leader. Even Rav Ovadia Yosef, when he gave his speeches, what do you think, everyone was with him? There was a lot of uh, people that were against him, religious people, were against him very much. A leader that unites everyone, I don't remember there's such leader ever, since I remember myself. That all, maybe Rav Shach, even not that. Rav Shach was very good for a lot of Faradim and Litaim, but Hasidim and Chabad were, you know, were not his followers. A leader that everyone was after him, you be our speaker, you speak for the religion, you speak for Judaism, we will all back you up, we will all follow your word and your instruction. There is no such leader. I think that Mashiach will be that leader. But even Mashiach, I'm not so sure who will, who will agree to accept him. What will happen if the Mashiach will be Litvish? Many Hasidim would not hold any of, anything of him. Or if he will be Hasidish, many Litvish will not want him. Or if he will be Sfaradi, some Hasidim and some Litvish won't want him. Or if he will be Yemenite, everybody else may, may not want him. So basically, whatever is going to be, if it's going to be Hasid Satmer, all the other Hasidim won't want him. If it will be Hasid Vishnitz, maybe the other Hasidim won't want him. So for any group it will come, there will be the majority of the other groups will be against him. I just hope, I just hope that once he will come and all the wicked Erev Rav will come to fight him, as it's written in the Zohar, that he will burn all of them by saying verses. I hope that the religious people that will remain after Gog and Magog and the cleanup of Hashem that clean, will cleanse the world, will cleanse the world, I hope that we will be smart enough not to open our stupid mouth after we see that miracle that all the wicked people are vanished and not one of them survive, at least not to be racist back then. But on the other hand, my personal opinion that racist Jews will not remain because they are wicked. If somebody hates Jews because they were born in a different country than him, that's a wicked person. If someone has a yeshiva and he doesn't accept Sfaradi kids because they're not Ashkenazim, that's a wicked person. If Sfaradi will not accept an Ashkenazi kid because he's not Sfaradi, that's a wicked person. If Hasid won't accept other Jewish kids because he's not Hasid, that's a wicked person. If someone will help only his kind of people, but no one else, that's not a righteous person. And I know that it's written that only the tzaddikim will remain. And I know that only very few go to heaven directly without going to hell first. Maybe that's one of the reasons why you could be someone who keeps all the Torah, all the mitzvot, and knows tons of Torah, and very, very strict with your davening, with everything you do, but in the end, when we connect you to a light detector, we will find out that 80% of the Jews you hate just because of their nationality. Because they eat different food than you and dress different and have different accent. So how can you be righteous? You hate the children of Hashem? I'm not talking if you hate the wicked people who wants to burn the Torah. That's mitzvah to hate them. We spoke about it many, many times. If you want the sources, read... Way of the Righteous, chapter 24. Over there it brings you all the sources. Who you should love and who you should hate. 
That uh, was written a thousand years ago. But now we're talking about when you, that you hate a, a righteous person just because he has different customs than you or different nationality or accent. This is terrible. Baruch Hashem, of course, not, not everyone is like this, especially in this generation when already we went to Israel and everything, everyone got mixed and most people speak Hebrew, Hebrew of Israel. It makes the differences between the people very small. Doesn't matter where your parents came from. You already, like same thing in America. Once the kids were born in America, there's not that much of a difference between Sephardi kids to Ashkenazi kids, because they're all Americans. But the Hasidim is different, because they they zealous to their culture. They remain with Yiddish, they remain with their, with their clothes, with, the, with their customs. They do not assimilate with American lifestyle, most of them at least. Even by Hasidim, you have modern ones that became Americanized, you know? Uh, but most of them are still very strict to the Yiddish. I know one very big tzaddik rabbi, I asked him once to come to, to our yeshiva to speak. He speaks perfect Hebrew. Speak five languages. One of them is Hebrew. And he said, I'm sorry, I have a rule. I only speak in Yiddish. I don't speak not in, Indi in English and not in Hebrew. And not in French. Only Yiddish. I never give a lecture unless if it's in Yiddish. Why? The way of my fathers. We don't make changes. Well, they stick to their tradition. There are many people like this. People like this, by them, you can see a big difference between them and Americans. But if you take an American Syrian kid, or Iraqi, or Persian, or Ashkenazi, that grew up in America, and they went to general yeshiva, you're not going to know the difference. Moroccan kid, Ashkenazi, they're all Americans. They love the same thing, they love the same food, same language, same accent. Some, some differences in the, in the customs when it comes to davening and other things, but that's it. Same thing in Israel. Let, let's wait and see where this all going to lead us to. I just want to finish the last thing before I, get in, I move on. Today, a girl in the Israeli army decided that she's a boy. She's, I don't know, 18, 19. She came to the general, hi, don't call me anymore. She? From now on, my name is Itzik. I'm not Rachel anymore. Forget about it. What do you mean? I don't feel that I'm a, I'm a woman. I don't feel I'm a man. I'm a, I feel I'm a woman. So please don't insult me anymore. It's the other way around. It's a, it's a, it's a woman that wanted to be a man. So her name, let's, I'm just making up a name. Let's call her Rachel. Rachel decided to be Itzik. She comes to the general, I... I don't feel Rachel. I feel I'm a man. From now on, please call me Itzik. What do you mean? If you're not going to do it, I'll sue you. You have to follow the rules of Israel right now. Everyone is into changing the sex of the children. I feel I'm a man. So what do you want me to do? Move me to a unit with men. And what do you think he did? He moved there. But that unit has a lot of religious boys, girl, soldiers, religious soldiers. They didn't listen to my warnings that the army will turn them into goyim. So they went to the army anyway. And what happened? They're going now to the public shower and she walks in. And she takes all kinds of hormones trying to look like a man, but it's not yet there. And she convinced herself she's a man. She walks in front of all the religious people in the public shower to take a shower and they say, hey, what are you doing here? You cannot come in. Touch me and I make a complaint against you. And then they want to win against the Arabs. No, such a clown army with such clown generals. How are you going to go and win the Hezbollah and the Hamas, all these gorillas? They see things like this and they fall on the floor, hilarious how dumb the Jews became. They laugh, the Arabs laugh. So I look at these Jews. Do you know the Arabs, it was very easy for them to attack the gay parade. Every year they know in advance the date, they know the place, and there's so many people, any bomb they throw, they will kill thousands 
or hundreds, they, ne they will never attack the gay parade. It's the best thing that can happen to them. Why? Because when they go to the mosque, the imam is showing them, look at these Jews, how wicked and evil they are against Hashem. They are the chosen people and look what they do. They declare a war against Allah. Our job is to slaughter all of them. So they're never going to attack them. Why? Because it's good for them. The more parades like this, the more Hashem gets angry at us. The more Hashem gets angry at us, He put us in their hand. And it's going to be very easy for them to take over Israel, as they do. They know where to attack. They're not going to attack them ever. They will only attack ultra-Orthodox people. Now they make sure to attack only religious people. Why? Because many times they attack regular people on the street, and later they found out they're not Jewish. Because half of the people in Israel are not Jewish. Half of the people are not Jewish. You have now 100 people walking in the street. 50 of them are going from Ukraine, from Russia, from uh, Thailand, from Philippines, Druzim, Arabs. So many goyim in Israel. So when you come and begin to shoot, in every terror attack you find out they kill goyim. So now the Arab realize what's the point? Target only people with yarmulkes. Like this for sure, you know you're killing Jews. But they won't they wanna attack in a gay parade. Why? Because then they will afraid to come next year. And it's defeat their own purpose. What's their purpose? They want to take over the land. And what does the Torah say? For sex crimes, the land will vomit you out. It's a, it's a verse in the Torah. And when you want to make the law of the land, the law of the land to abomination, pure abomination, the law of the land, Right? Then the, the land will vomit the Jews out of Israel. And who's going to remain there? Those who don't dare to do things like this. By them, there's no parades. By them, nobody puts in a Facebook that he has a boyfriend or he has a husband. Or they're going to make in Jenin or in Ramallah or in Jericho or in Gaza a wedding between Ahmed and Mustafa. Because when they will do such thing, you know what will happen? Five jeeps of the Hamas would show up and shoot all the people over there to death. It happens once. Not by a, way, a gay wedding. By a wedding that was not modest. Between a, an Arab to his, to his girlfriend, they got married. And the dancing there got mixed, boys and girls. You can see it on YouTube. Two jeeps showed up and in less than a minute killed all of them. With automatic weapon. They shot their own people, their own cousins, their own neighbors for making a mixed party. Therefore, no one will ever dare to do what, what the people of Tel Aviv do. And that's why we're losing Israel, Rabotai. We're losing it. We lost the south. We lost the north. In the middle, we, we, we're losing Jaffa. We're losing Lud. We're losing more and more territories. Just like a person that has cancer in his body, and every month he takes another organ, kidney, and liver, and stomach, and here, and there, and in the neck. Eventually everybody knows the more parts of the body the cancer attack until the person died. And that's the situation we are in right now. Stage four cancer. No exaggeration should know that. Be prepared for what's coming. If Mashiach won't come in the next two, three, four, five years, that's it. Israel, you're going to need an Arab passport to enter there. Give it five years. Unless a miracle will happen. That's it. You're going to want to come to Israel? I have to bring an Arab passport. They'll take over. What are you going to do? They're already taking over things, and there's, there's, the Israelis cannot do anything against it. They're occupying places, and, and nobody can do anything. We don't have the strength to fight those monsters. We don't. They are brave, and they're willing to die for their cause. They convince themselves with lies that Israel belongs to them, and Jerusalem belongs to them, even though it's not even mentioned in the Quran. In the beginning, they all knew that Israel belongs to us because it's written in the Quran, but now nobody cares anymore. That's it. 
They con convince themselves. They're, not, they're such liars that they say that the people that came to Israel by Hashem was Palestinians, not the Jews. And that Ishmael was the one that Abraham took to the Akedah. He was the chosen one. Even though it's written in the Torah clearly, they said that the Jews changed the Torah. You ask them, how the Jews change the Torah? You have thousands of Torahs everywhere in the world, tens of thousands of them. They all have the same version. How all of them knew one day to change all the books in the world and replace Ishmael with Isaac? How did they know that? And without having any spelling issues? Everybody knew how to do it when there was no telecommunication, no phones, no videos, no, no nothing, no cars. One day everybody woke up in the morning with a prophecy that you have to change the Torah and instead of Ishmael put Isaac. Everybody knew, everybody knew how to modify the Torah word by word without having connection. Obviously, it's <laughs> the biggest stupidity. So now what happened? One person in Israel made a joke. Okay, so if this girl decided that she's a man, and she wants to act as a man, and she wants to go to the men shower, so I decided that I'm the head of the army. I'm an officer. I'm an officer. You, you officer, you are under me. You only have two lines. I have a star. So you're going to go and clean the bathroom and bring all your soldiers. I want to check them out. Who are, who are, who are you? How, how long are you in the army? Two months. You're giving me orders? Yes. Why not? I decided that I am not a two-month-old soldier. I am 15 years old, and I have a star here. I'm your officer. Why not? Why not? If everybody can decide what he wants to be and force everyone to agree to that, everybody will decide what he wants to be. I decide that I'm the new Sleepy Joe. I promise you I'll sleep less than him. I run the show from now on. Let me go into Congress, give speeches there, and rule the world and decide what to do, what not to do. Why not? Who can tell me no? Why he can decide to be he, he, she, and she can decide to be he, and I cannot be, decide to be the president. You understand the paradox here? Ay, 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 I don't know what to do anymore. Tov. When uh, we read the longest parasha on Shabbat, Parashat Naso, it has 176 verses, longer than any other chapter in the Torah. It's interesting how the longest Masechet in the Oral Torah, in the Gemara, it's Baba Batra, 176 pages. And the longest chapter in Tehilim is 176 verses. It's very interesting. How? I don't know what's so special about this number, but the longest parasha is, has 176 verses. That's Parashat Naso. We are in a book of Bamidbar. Numbers. In the parasha, in the parasha, we have a, a very interesting verse. Very interesting verse in the parasha. Ve'ish et kodashav lo yiu. A person that will have all his sacrifices they will be his. It's a little bit strange, no? Who else they will be? If I decided to bring a sacrifice to the temple and get a sheep, I have to bring it for myself. If it's stolen, it cannot be a sacrifice. So after I go and sacrifice it, what does it mean, lo you? What does it mean? The answer is, Rabotai, there are some things that belong to a person for eternity. Most of the things that belong to you are only at your possession for X amount of time. Even your own life here in this planet, it's not yours. Because in any second, Hashem can take it away from you. So it's not permanently yours. Your house is not yours. Today is yours, tomorrow you lose it. Do you know how many people alone today lost their houses in America? Just alone. You know, you saw what happened in the stock market today and on Friday? People got wiped out what they saved 20 years they lost in the last two days. 
Friday and today. The market totally crashed. Hundreds of billions of dollars were wiped off today and hundreds of billions were wiped off on Friday and supposedly tomorrow another horrible day. The interest rate going up, reduction of 22% of mortgages in one month already since they increased the interest rate. 22% less applications for mortgages. On uh, Wednesday, because of the horrible inflation who destroys the world, thanks to Putin and his stupid ideas, and thanks to the COVID, of course, it's all the hand of Hashem. So now, as a result of that, they're going to increase the interest rate by another 0.75% which will knock down the housing market completely. Every house that you see right now, 3 million, 4 million, 2 million, give it a few months, it will go down by 50%. Houses will be on the market, no one will be able to get a mortgage. Why? Paying extra 2% a year on a $3 million mortgage is a big difference. It's extra $5,000 a month interest. Extra. People, it's too much for them, can't afford it. I remember when mortgage rates were 9%, a house in Monsi was $150,000 with one acre land. Same house today is a million and a half, 10 times more, with an acre land. Imagine life that houses will go back to two, $300,000 and you're gonna pay 9% interest. Imagine life like this, like it was 20 years ago. I don't think it's going to be that bad, but it's already a disaster. I want to prepare all of you, prepare all of you to one of the hardest times that this country will ever know, coming up in the next few months. Expect riots, expect robberies every five minutes. Do not walk on the street with expensive watches. Better to get rid of your fancy car. It will attract attention to you and you can get killed for that. Try not to be looking too rich on the street. How expensive about you say expensive car? What kind of expensive in America? Anything that is more than $500 a month could be already attracting attention by criminals on the street to target you as a victim. You have to understand, today, they have nothing to lose. There are people who cannot bring food at home, all kinds of criminals out there, all kinds of drug addicts who don't have money for their drugs. They come right away with a gun, they break into the store and they clean all the jewelry in five minutes, put everyone on the floor. There are robberies every day now. It's dangerous, but you have to be careful not to go to places at night, places that are dangerous. Try not to walk on the street at all in dangerous areas. Definitely not on time that it's dark. Life is not what it was. That's it. The picnic in America is over for good. Now it's going to be a disaster. You have to be ready for it. A disaster of what's going to happen here. So those who can store some food, do it. If you have garage, put many bags of rice, put tuna cans, put anything you can put that doesn't get spoiled. You never know what can happen. It can, I'm telling you, it can be a disaster. You can go to a store now, you come out of the Costco par uh, parking lot and someone will rob your food. Put everything in my car or I'll kill you with a knife. And you're gonna have to, whatever you just shop, that you have to put in their car, it will happen. Why? when people have nothing to feed their children and they're already criminals, they justify their actions. They have to be very ready for that. Remember, there's a lot of people who have adjustable mortgage. They struggle as it is to pay it because of COVID and all that. Now, if their mortgage was 3,000 a month, it just jumped to four or four and a half thousand after Wednesday. These people will not make it. Plus, energy bills are double because of a barrel of gallon, a gallon of a barrel of oil is $120. Over a year ago, it was minus $30. Do you know what it means, minus $30? 
that the oil companies have so many barrels of oil on boats that they have nowhere to store it because storage would cost them so much money. There was no demand for oil because of the COVID. So they said, anyone who wants to collect the oil, we will pay you $30 for every barrel you take for clearing our storages. You want to take a barrel of oil? We will pay you $30 gift. You get it for free, and we will pay you $30. A year later, it went up by $150. Thanks to COVID and thanks to the war in Ukraine. It's affect all the prices everywhere. Everything you buy costs more money now. Plastic plates, plastic cups, plastic tables. Everything is made with oil. All the machinery, everything. It's amazing. There are so many electrical cars are going on a road and the prices of oil only going higher and higher. They lost control of the inflation. They lost control of the economy. We only gonna know in a year from now where it's gonna lead us to. It's very, very scary days. Rabotai, please do not attract attention on the streets. Don't walk with expensive things. It's one thing they rob your watch, forty, fifty thousand dollars watch. They can kill you for that. Remember, these people are dangerous. You make a move or something, they get nervous, they stab you or they shoot you. Or a bullet comes out or anything like that, or they hit you on the head, just to, they're afraid that you're gonna call the police, they're gonna hit you with a gun on your head, and Chaz Shalom can die just from that, or go into coma. You gotta be very careful. So, Ve'ishet Kodashav Yelo, some things belongs to a person for eternity. What is it? The mitzvot, the good deeds that you committed, it's yours for eternity. No one can take it away from you. There's no way to steal it from your account. Even if you have a crypto account, someone can break in and steal your wallet. Happens to someone I know. Someone sent him a link. He clicked on a link. Ten minutes later, a million and a half dollars disappeared from his crypto wallet. FBI told him, you <laughs> you serious? You know how many cases like this we have a day? We do not even know how to handle it, even if we wanted. We still learn the subject. We don't know how to deal with international cryptos and these and uh, anonymous transactions. We don't know what to do. Imagine we have thousands like this every day. What are we going to do? We're going to need five million FBI agents just for that. It's a wild uh, west. Everyone who knows some computer can get into your computer and steal everything you have in a minute. Imagine this, Rabotai. You walk 30 years like a dog, like a slave. Save, 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 like people like to save and save. And then in a minute, Hashem sends somebody to you and wipe you out in a minute. How do you start now? How do you start? When it happened, you know what's the first thing that comes to your mind? At least I wish I would give it to Tzedakah. Because like this, it comes with me to the next world for eternity. Now I didn't give it for Tzedakah. And some criminal from some country stole it. And I lost 30 years of life. 30 years. 30 years of hard work from morning to night. Meetings, traveling, business meeting. Oh, so much time from your life, neglecting your family, your children, everything. In one minute, everything is stolen from you. 30 years of life. What a punishment. Think about it. It happens to thousands of people every week here. Here in New York alone. Thousands of people. They wake up, they open the computer. If they don't lose it in the stock market or by Madoff, I lose it now in crypto. Someone just get into the computer and steal everything you have. Or, chas v'shalom, sicknesses, problems, doctors, surgeries, this, that, Hashem irachem. There's many ways for Hashem to wipe up a person. That's why the parasha begins, ve'ish et kodashav, what's holy, what you turn to holy by... Deduct, dedicating it to Hashem, 
It's yours for eternity. Lo you. Nobody can take it from you. It's going to be yours. Anything else? For now, you're using it. You use your Mercedes. It's not yours. You use your mansion, but it's not yours. You use your watch, but it's not yours. Why? At any second, I can take it away from you. What I cannot take from you is, is your mitzvot and your Torah and your donations and how many souls you save. This, even Hashem cannot take away from you. Even Hashem cannot take it away from you. Why? Because it's against his Torah. He cannot do it. If Hashem will not pay you your reward for the tzedakah you gave, that means the whole Torah is a lie. And it will never happen. Do you understand or no? If the Torah tells you that tzedakah is safe from death, and it won't, the Torah is a lie. And it will never happen. You get the point here or no? So there's no better assurance then once you see it's written in a book of God that that's yours for eternity, you can feel safe and secure. It's nothing that anyone can rob you from. There's only one way to lose it. Remember, once we spoke about it, if you regret that you did it. Yes, if you do tshuva and you say, I'm sorry, I was stupid, I was angry, forgive me, I don't regret it. Yes, you can save it. Remember, the will of Hashem is to give it to you. He wants to give you the reward. That's the whole purpose of this world. For you to, co to collect as much as you can that you will cash on it on the next eternal world. So Hashem is not, is not interested to punish a person for nothing, to take away all his reward. The opposite is, is anxious that we will do the right thing, that he should pay us a reward. So if we did something stupid in a moment of anger, we say, oh, I regret I did it. And the next day we regret again that we regret yesterday. And we want it back. Of course we're going to get it back. The question is if we did a sincere tshuva. Chazal, our sages in Masechen Sanhedrin, page 88. Ma Mashiach? What a person can do to, to get saved from the time of the contractions of Messiah. What's contractions? A woman, when she's pregnant, every month is get harder, right? She has to carry more weight and it's harder and harder until he gets to the last day. The day of delivery is the hardest. Why? The contractions begin. And then they become more often and more and more and more. And then comes the biggest pain. And then what? The redemption comes. The salvation. The pain is gone. The voice of the baby is starting. And that's a very happy moment. But what was a minute before? The woman cursed the moment she was born. She cares everyone around. If her husband stand there, right there, she would curse him, she would curse the doctor, she would scream, she would... Why? She can't handle the pain. The worst pain you can think of. So, the same thing will be with Mashiach. Just before he will come, we will run into contractions. Just like now. Every hour, a new tragedy. Every hour. War, COVID, Sleepy Joe, lefties, sec secular court, war against Torah, terrible government, Muslim brothers, Hamas, Hezbollah, Iran, crime, inflation, unemployment, sicknesses, problems, non-stop problems. Only get worse. Only get worse. Why? It's a part of the plan. Until Mashiach would come, it's only going to get worse. Only going to get worse. Do you really think that there is a natural way to save Israel from the situation we are in now? How? What kind of soldiers we have that can go and fight these gorillas over there? Did you see how they look and how they look? A feminine soldier from Tel Aviv with his gel, skinny like this, walking like a woman. He's going to fight these monster murderers that they're going to rip his head off with their hands. They don't even need a knife. Plus, 
They are waiting to get killed in battle. They're not afraid. They are so brainwashed that if they die killing Jews, they're going to heaven. And in heaven, they're going to have a, a, a surprise waiting for them. They do not know what a surprise waiting for them. But they're brainwashed to think that they have a, a pleasant surprise. And the Israeli soldier is afraid from his shadow. Most of them, of course, not everyone. Some Israeli fighters, most of the Datim Leumim, the Zionist religious ones, they're very good. They also have a cause. They're willing to die for the land. But they are maybe 15% of the army. The rest of the army have no ideology. If you give them a green card in America, immediately they get on a, fly, on a plane and come here. Why should they fight for Israel? Do you understand the way their mentality is? They live like Goim, they act like Goim, they don't feel any connection to Israel. I happen to be born here. Put me in New York, I'll be happier. So the Chachamim say, uh, you know, what a person will do, the answer is, Yasok Batorah of Igmilut Chasadim. We'll learn a lot of Torah, support Torah, and do a lot of act of kindness. For instance, the, the Zohar brings a story. Rabbi Yossi and Rabbi Chia walked together on the, on the road. And they saw a person that has leprosy. They told him, you know, you have leprosy. You should uh, repent. Check what you do wrong. They started to attack him. Shame on you. Meaning, what are you doing? You speak in Lashon Hara? Why Hashem gave you leprosy? Why they did it? They wanted to embarrass him? They wanted to hurt him? That's the, the only rabbis we had 2,000 years ago? Of course not. Even today, rabbis don't do things like this. To attack someone like this for nothing on the street. Not knowing him, Bechlal. They don't know who he is. They just see that he has leprosy. It's to wake him up to do tshuva that he should get rid of the leprosy. In, the, in those days when a rabbi attacked you, you took it very much to the heart because of the shame. So after that, you definitely will repent. So if you will repent, you get rid of the leprosy. So they told, he told them, you probably the students of Rashbi, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, is a strict, zealous rabbi. He was not politically correct and did not kiss up to anyone. Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. That's why you're not afraid of anyone. You say it as it is. The person told them. Right away, after a few minutes, his, his children showed up and they were all Talmidei Chachamim, high scholars of Torah. His children. They said, you know, they started to talk divrei Torah that someone with leprosy, he can get leprosy not only because of Lashon Hara. There's other reasons as well. For instance, if you saw someone acting bad and committing a sin against Hashem and you did not rebuke him, you can get leprosy for that. You didn't speak Lashon Hara, you're very careful. You saw someone is doing something wrong and you did not make any comments, no warning, no rebuke, nothing. That second Hashem can decree on you to get leprosy. The boy... The youngest boy say, the same way a person is being punished for forbidden talking, the same way he is going to be sued and held responsible for if he can cheer up a person, can cheer up a Jew in time of trouble, and he ignored him, he did not bring, lift his spirit up, he can also be punished for that as well. As it's written in Tehillim, Psalms 39, verse 3. Translation. Ne'elamti dumia means I kept silent. I didn't say anything. And I did not rebuke someone that was supposed to hear my rebuke. And I did not say any good word to him to inspire him as well. 
and the bitter results of my act is Ke'evin Ekar, immediately massive suffering started in my life. One minute, sufferings of 30 years. Who can give me an example of one minute doing the wrong thing and then suffering for 12 years from morning to night after that? For one minute. In the Gemara. Very good, Benji. Baruch Hashem. Rabbi Yudar Nasi. There was a calf that was waiting on line to be slaughtered. And he saw how they slaughtering the other animals, got nervous. He went to hide under the dress of Rabbi Yudar Nasi, put his head under his glima. And Rabbi pushed his head and said, Go, you were created to be eaten. What are we going to eat? We need to eat your meat. So he pushed him back to the line. Because he didn't have mercy on an animal, even though he was right about what he said, what he said, it's true, Hashem made them for us to eat them and to give us milk and to use their skin. We use it for Sefer Torah, for Tfilin, for Mezuzot. There's a lot of good come from the cows. But because he did not feel bad for the calf, immediately he got pain in his gallbladder for 12 years. 12 years. 12 years of suffering. When did the suffering go away? Went away, when? After 12 years, he saw the maid making the mice fly with a boom. And he said, hey, hey, why don't you have mercy on the mice? V'rachamav al kol ma'asav, even Hashem have mercy on every animal. You should also have mercy. That minute, when he finally fixed what he did wrong 12 years ago, the pain went away. Nothing helped him, not the slichot, not the davening every day, not the tehillim he read, not all the Torah he taught, and not the Mishnah that he wrote and saved the oral Torah to the Jewish nation and the future of the Torah. None of that helped him. What helped him? The particular problem that he had, until he did not fix it, he could not get cured. Twelve years of suffering for one minute, and it's not, it wasn't a sin what he did. It's, you can't say he committed a sin. He didn't break Shabbat. He didn't eat something not kosher. He didn't speak Lashon Hara. He didn't eat without bracha. That's a sin. All he did, push back the calf, because one way or the other he will get there. With or without me. That's why they brought him here. To the slaughtering house. When David Amelech, when King David say, Chatati, when the prophet Nathan came to him to tell him what, what he did wrong, immediately David say, Chatati, and right after that you have a comma. What is, it, what is this Efsek? Piska. Vayomer David, Chatati Hashem. Nathan answer him, Gam Hashem evir Chatatcha, lo tamut. Hashem, past your sin, you will not die for it. The Gaon Mi Vilna explained, David wanted to continue the sentence, Chatati, Aviti, Pashati. Not just Chatati. Chatati means not intentionally. Aviti means intentionally. Pashati means intentionally on purpose to get Hashem angry. Mamash to rebel. But Hashem already knew that that's what he wanted to say. Chatati aviti pashati. He stopped him in the middle of the sentence, the prophet. He did not let him finish. He just said chatati, immediately answered him. Vayomer Natan el David, gam Hashem evir chatatcha. Therefore, David say in Tehillim, in Psalms 32, verse 5, Chatati Odiacha, I'm informing you. Vavoni lo kisiti, I did not ever try to cover my crimes. I wanted to say Aviti, but the Prophet cut me in the middle. You know my intention was to confess fully. Amarti Odea Lepeshaai, 
I said, I am confessing my crimes. I wanted also to say Pashati. But you forgave me right away. Just when I say Chatati, immediately you inform me by the Prophet that my sin is past. It's like deleted. David did not really commit any crime. The Gemara Sekola Omer David Chatai no El He only took back his Shiduch, but Sheva was his soulmate. But he did it in such a way that it didn't look good. There was no crime was done here, no sin. Why? Because when Uriah Chiti, the one who married her, instead of David, only married her because of mistake that David made. When David killed Goliath, he chopped his head off. But, be, but in order for him to chop his head off, he needed to use his sword. He needed a big sword, he had a big head, he was a giant. So he asked, anyone knows how to open this special knot here? It's a very complicated knot. And this guy came, Uriah Hiti, he's the one who made the knot. I know, David made a mistake, he was so excited that he just killed the Philistine, and now the Jewish nation won't have to be slaves to the Philistines. They're going to pay us taxes instead of we be their servants. He was so excited from his achievement, the miracle, David, little David won against this Philistine giant wicked monster. So he said, anyone who will know how to open the knot of the sword will get the best shiduch. Who has the best shiduch? Batsheva, his shiduch. Hashem took his shiduch and gave it to this Uriah. Now, David see Batsheva one time standing on the roof of the building, immediately fall in love with her. How can he not? This is his shiduch. He doesn't belong to this guy. His mistake made him get punished that she went to him. So immediately his neshama feels that that's my other half. So what's going to be now? So there is a war. All the soldiers that go to the war give a get to their wife in case they don't show up. Because if they disappear in a war, no one will ever know where they are. On my way here, I just got a video of uh, two religious parents that their boy is missing for 78 days. I don't know when this video was filmed. Maybe it was filmed a week or two or three ago. But at the time of the video, 78 days is gone. Nobody knows where he is. Nobody. They look for him everywhere. Disappeared. He went to Meron and never came back. Or... Orthodox, righteous, yeshiva boy, with no problem. You cannot say that he wanted to kill himself or anything like this. Regular boy, went to Meron, disappeared. You know how many people like this, the Arabs make disappear every year? They kill them, cut them to pieces, bury them in some place and no one ever knows. Nobody ever finds out. Nobody knows. Imagine this. You don't even know if your kid is alive. He was kidnapped. They locked him in some place. You don't know. You have to live the rest of your life with the unknown. Worse than to know. When you know, at least you have a grave to come and cry. When you don't know the thoughts, what they can do to him somewhere, whoever kidnapped him, you have no idea what they do to him. So... David Amelech, when they went to the war, Uriah Chiti gave Batsheva a get. And then David took her. She was a free woman. But when he came back from the war and found out what David did, he got very angry. So David invited him to come to an, a meeting to explain to him what happened. But he re rebelled. He said, who is he? I'm not going to go. When you rebel against the king, you have to get a death penalty. If you speak a word against the king, or you act against the king, or the king invites you and you refuse to come, according to halacha, is moret b'malchut. Moret, rebel against the kingdom. Rebel against the kingdom, death penalty. But David did not want to kill him in execution like he should have. Because then what would people say? David killed him and took his wife? How is it going to look? 
It's going to look terrible. So what did he do? He sent him in the first row to the war to die. And that, that looked very bad. So that's why Hashem sent the prophet to David to tell him what he did was wrong. Even though he never committed any sin. Technically. But sometimes it's kosher but smells, you know? Sometimes you want to eat a fish. Fish is kosher, salmon, tuna, whatever. But it smells terrible. Sometimes it doesn't smell, but it's not kosher. But sometimes it's kosher. What do you want? But it's spoiled. What are you eating? You can, you can die from it. That's what happened over here. It was kosher, but smells bad in the eyes of the public. So now David immediately confessed. Chatati, aviti, pashati. Now they listen to what the Gemara says. Listen carefully. After David confessed his sin, right? What was his punishment? Who knows? What was his punishment? Six of his children died. Six months he had leprosy. The Shekhinah of Hashem, the spirit of Hashem that was with him daily disappeared from him. Sanhedrin, all the Chachamim of Sanhedrin stayed away from him. All his life he was crying for it. Every day. 13 years he was sick. He went to bed. Seven pillows. They were changing every day because he was flooded from his tears. Seven pillows. Try to flood one pillow with your tears a day. Let's see you. Seven pillows. It was so wet, they had to replace it. And we, we don't commit sins like David. <laughs> that technically was kosher. I don't want to even go into details. We have no problem saying khatati. You know how David do yesterday? I went to the early minyan at 5 a.m., quarter to 5 in the morning. The day just started. People wake up at 4 to come to the shul to be there by quarter to 5. Nets minyan. Is that a big sacrifice or no? Right, right? Impressive, right? Not necessarily. After we finished the Shmona Esrei, the Chazan, that is, happened to be a nice man. Friendly, nice. Do you know how he did the vidui, the confession? Finished. By the time I came, Ashamnu Baganu Chazan, Ibarnu Dofi Vrashon Ara, Vayavor Hashem Al Pana Vayikra. So what happened? I wanted to make a point. What's the point? I'm not going to cut my confession just because you're in a rush. Where, where can you rush to at five in the morning? It's not that it's nine. Oh, he's in a rush to work. He's going to get fired. It's the habit of the Yetzirah. So what did I do? I continued the confession loud. Meaning, he's already Hashem, Hashem, El, Rachul, Lechanun, and everybody's trying to catch up to him. By the time he finished and he sat down, you know, there's a silent moment, silent in the shul, I continue my confession loud, on purpose. When I finish what I finish, after the davening, there's a nice tzaddik, Ger Tzedek, over there in the Minyan, Spanish Ger Tzedek, convert. He said to me, Rabbi, Rabbi, can I ask you a question? Because he paid attention to what happened. He said, to, I said, of course. He said, wait, but wait, wait. He called up the guy that there was the chazan. And he wanted to ask the question in front of him. He said, Rabbi, did you make it today to the confession with, the, with us? What do you think? It was too fast or no? I didn't realize for a second that the guy was standing behind, the guy that the chazan. I said, absolutely, it's crazy. Too fast. Better not to say confession than to do it like this. <laughs> not only that, the person who confessed like this is going to get punishment for that confession separately. And he's right behind me, the guy. 
The convert wanted to make a point. If you do it, do it right. I did not convert to Judaism to show Hashem that he's davening his burden to me. But Hashem wanted this nice chazan to hear the truth. If you don't want to do it right, don't do it at all. Confession, when you daven, Hashem nubagano, it's mitzvah from the Torah. The davening is mitzvah de Rabbanan. The part of the confession, Ana Hashem, Ashamnu, Bagadnu, Gazalnu, that's mitzvah of tshuva from the Torah. Mitzvah vidui. Confession. I don't get it. You have a mitzvah from the Torah who helps you to ease your punishments. And you're standing in front of the judge begging for your life and for second chance. And how do you do it? Your Honor, I'm asking you please to forgive me. I don't want to... I'm in a rush. I'm in a rush. 5 a.m. You stand in front of the judge in the court. Judge Williams. Yes, judge. What can you say for your protection? I'm sorry, I'm in a rush. I'm wasting my time. The judge said, I got it. Instead of three years, 13 years in prison. What? For your chutzpah, you fool. You have an opportunity to beg for your life, and what do you do? Better not to confess. If you confess in such a terrible way, you only make yourself look more stupid than before. You don't confess, you don't confess. It's bad. You have an opportunity. You don't want to take advantage on it. But to do it in such an obvious way that, Hashem, you are such a burden in my life. I'm sorry, I even have to confess to you. <laughs> it makes it worse. I once gave an example. Two people come to the judge in court. One gives a whole speech to the judge, how he loves him, he loves the court system, he loves the justice in America. And then he takes his shoe and throws it in the face of the judge. And the other uh, criminal say, I hate them, I hate the court, I don't accept the court, I, uh, I don't care about this, I don't, I'm never, myself will never surrender to such a rotten law. And he take his shoe and throw it at the judge. Both of them threw a shoe at the judge. But one gave a speech how much he appreciated the judge and the court system and how everything is wonderful and righteous here. And then threw the stone in the, fa the, the shoe in the, stone in the face of the judge. Who do you think the judge will be angry at? The one who cares the system and say I hate it and threw the, the, the shoe? Or the one who complimented everything and threw the shoe? Here you go, you got your answer. So, Rav Yonatan Eifschitz, the legendary book, Yaarot Dvash, 200 years ago. He said, there, there is such a term called baseless hatred, sinat chinam. Sinat chinam of the soul. You hating a different soul. A Jew stand in a shul and he sees someone speaking in the middle of Kaddish or in the middle of reading the Torah. And he stands and does nothing about it. It doesn't bother him. You see people talk, have a conversation in the middle. Shabbat, they, lean, they read in the Torah. Two people speak about whatever. And he sits next to them and he doesn't even go, shh, nothing. Nothing. And then he joined the conversation sometimes. Ah, he became a chat, chat room. He doesn't say, he doesn't rebuke, he doesn't charge them, nothing. He said, what should I, why do I need headache? If I'm going to come and tell them, hey, quickly, please be quiet, then what, they're going to think I'm, I'm trying to be the rabbi. Why do I need to put myself in this position? So, the job of the rabbi, if the rabbi doesn't do his job, it's also your job. If you see some, the rabbi is there now and you, you hear two people behind you speak. Your job is to tell them, excuse me, it's a shul here. We're not here in the park. You know? So you do it again. 
So what are you afraid? You're afraid that they're going to hate you, right? So Rav Yonatan Eifshit says, Rav Yonatan Eifshit says, when your friend rebuke you, he's coming and say to you, when your good friend rebuke you, I know I have the same problem. I also sometimes talk in the middle of Kaddish. We know each other for years. You know, I used to have this problem also, but I got rid of it. Try. That's very good. Why, if you're a friend of someone and you rebuke him, it will help more than a stranger. If a stranger come and rebuke him, it doesn't help so much. But if you actually rebuke your friend, that should help. Not rebuking him, it's sinat chinam. That's what he says. Seeing a Jew speaking in the middle of Kaddish or in the middle of reading Torah or in a shul in general and not rebuking him, that's sinat chinam. Because you let him get guilty now and he's going to be punished for that and you could have prevented it. If you loved him, you would stop him. If it would be your child, you would speak to him seriously at home. You're not afraid of the punishment you're going to get? He's speaking in the middle of reading the Torah. Someone was trying to speak to me on Shabbat in a shul. Why? He got angry. He didn't get aliyah. They didn't give him aliyah for more than a month. So he gets angry. Why? Nobody cares about him. That's how he thinks. So he comes to cry to someone. Who is he coming to cry to? To me. So I, as soon as he come to me, he sat in a chair next to me. Immediately I say, shh. Didn't let him talk. He, he started. Shh. He tried again. Shh. Shh. Not now. Shh. It's dying to talk. Do you know what it is when someone is angry, it's fuming? So I see how he's moving with his body language. He's dying already. When is he going to finish already reading? That between one ole to the other, he can talk. You understand? When people have, uh, they're impulsive, they need to say something. It's hard to stop them, but that's your obligation. The Mishnah Brura said that one time they saw Elijah, the prophet, Eliyahu Navi, with camels full of af vechema, bad angels, terrible angels. They asked him, who are those angels going to? He said to the people that speaks in the middle of Kaddish. People that speaks in the middle of Kaddish. If you see your friend is about to fall into a furnace, lava, is about to jump not knowing he's going to fall into lava, and you stand and watch him, enjoy the jump, you are a criminal. Everybody agree, right? In any court, in a world, nothing to do with religion. In Zimbabwe, if they knew that you were there and you knew there is lava down there and you let a person jump, they will hold you as, not as, as causing someone death. Maybe not as a murderer, but not preventing death, right? You can go a few years to prison in any country. That's exactly the same thing here. Why are you so surprised? If someone is talking in the middle of davening and Kaddish and this, he's going to get severely punished. Not stopping it is a crime. Not rebuking the public in your speeches is a crime. You may say, but they're not coming. They're not in a mood to hear now on their head, someone banging on their head for two hours. They want someone who tells jokes. Why do you worry? That's not your problem. Your job is to do what's right. The rest is not in your hand. I want to ask you a question. Take a musician. Best musician. If he plays his original music without mistakes, everything is aligned, the, 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 the notes, everything perfect, and he gets 50 people coming to the show, and if he mess up the whole music, completely mess. But a lot of people heard about it, that he, he plays so bad, and it's such a good joke, and now he has a thousand people coming to listen to him. He makes a lot more money, no, when a thousand people come to the concert. 
than only 50. What do you think is going to do? Is going to play the music correctly? And those who want to come, come. And those who don't want to come, it's their problem. Or is going to mess up the whole music just because people like to see how corrupted it is. The musician that is a real musician will never agree on purpose to play terrible. Never. That reminds me that one time there was a wedding and Rav Moshe Feinstein Zatzal was there. And the band was so bad, they were playing off tune until the religious people started to boo them. That's how bad it was. Wow, well, how do you dare to come to a wedding and play if you don't know how to play and you don't have no matching? He got the saxophone play one thing, the piano play something else. The drummer is in a different world. When Rav Moshe Feinstein saw that people lost their patience to the band, he got up on a, on a stage and took the microphone, the biggest rabbi in America, maybe in the whole world, and said, I would like to tell the band how much I love your music and how wonderful you are playing. And thank you for coming here tonight to play for us. We all appreciate it, right? Of <laughs> course, if Einstein said such thing, everyone clap. It turned into a big clapping. He got off the stage. You had to see how they play. Like a professional band. From that moment on, everything went smooth. Why? It was their first show. They didn't have confidence. He gave them the confidence. From the minute everybody got up and clapped, and the biggest rabbi in the world said, how much you enjoy your music, their hands stopped to shake. And from that moment on, they play, and the rest is history. It became one of the best <laughs> wedding bands. One good word. That's also, by the way, an obligation. But how many people would do such things? One time, there was a two bar mitzvah in a shul on Shabbat. Two boys read. The first one who got up the aliyah read horrible. Off tune, made mistakes a lot. He wasn't so prepared. When the second boy got after him, also read bad. But that kid, he was very good in reading. So his father came to him and said, we tested you 50 times. You say that by heart. How did you sing so bad and off tune? He said, I did not want to embarrass the first boy. The first boy was so bad and people started to correct him. I, I saw how he got nervous. So I wanted to show him, no, you're not the only one who don't know here. I also messed up to make him feel better. How many kids like this you have in the world that are willing to take the embarrassment after preparing 500 times their bar mitzvah laning? They're willing to mess it up just for another Jew not to be embarrassed in public. Think about it. Time is running out. We have a few more minutes left. Many people, as I said, are accumulating more and more and more assets, money, this, that, okay. When they lose it, they begin to think, ah, I am such a fool. I have nothing now. No mitzvot, no olam haba, and no money. At least I would give it, right? That's the way the satan is. First he convinces you, hold it, hold it. Don't give too much. Why are you so generous? The rabbi take advantage on you. Why are you giving so much? It's enough you give a half or a third of what you're giving. That's the way the Satan is. He doesn't want you to have a great Olam Abba. When you lose the money, he comes to you and says, you fool, you could have given it to mitzvot, to Torah. Look what happened now. You don't have this and you don't have that. Why? He wants to break your spirit, to make you depressed. How many times a day people write to me, there's no lecture on tonight. Where is the lecture from two days ago? Why is it not on? 
I'm very depressed, I need a lecture. I'm very depressed. That's a very common word now. I'm very depressed. I'm glad at least that when they press, they want to come to listen to a lecture and not some goish music. That's already a progress. So it reminds the story that the father wanted to test his son in math. He said to him, son, a hunter saw ten birds on the roof. He shot and hit one of them. The bird fell on the floor. How many are left? The boy say one. The father said, how come one? There was ten. One he hit. How many are left? The boy said, one. Why? The father said, how come one? He said, the nine flew right away when they heard the shot. What do we have left? One. One. Same thing over here. When you ask a person, you just gave $100,000 to the yeshiva. How much you have left? Meaning, how many millions you still have that, you, you know, after giving so much? Thinking he's going to say two million left, three million left, right? The answer should be how much I have left, a hundred thousand. Because that's my guarantee. The other one is today mine, tomorrow I lose it. There's no guarantee I have it. That's exactly what's going on. Uh, Rav Galinsky told a story when he was a child, he went to the rabbi of the city, Rav Chizkiah Yosef Mishkovsky Zatzal. And the rabbi asked the kids, I'm going to give you a quiz. There were five lit candles. One person shot, put off two of them. How many are left? Everybody answer three. You are wrong, the rabbi said. There are two. We didn't understand. The rabbi said, three continue to burn until nothing left from them. The only one who are left are the two that we put off. <laughs> the other three will be gone. Right? So, what's the message of the story? So a person has X amount of money and he gives some of it to tzedakah. Supposedly, he decreased his amount. In the end, the money in this world would leave him. Or he leave the money. One where they will have to separate from each other. What money will not be ever separated from him? The money he sent to the next world, meaning to give it to a good cause of tzedakah. <laughs> Rav Chizkiah Yosef Mishkovsky, that's a, the rabbi we just talked about, was the right-hand man of the biggest chacham in Europe, Rav Chaim Ozer Grozinski. Rav Chaim Ozer. One time he heard from Rav Chaim Oizer when he published his famous book, Achiezer. He gave a copy of the book to Rabbi Eliyahu Chaim Meisel, Zatzal, from Lodz. And he asked him, when will I have the merit to see the book of Kvod Arav, meaning Rabbi Meisel? When will I also get a book from you, like I just gave you? Rav Meisel told him, I have a book. Every day I add few more lines to that book. You want to see it? Rav Chaim Oizer said, what kind of book that you only add few more lines to that book every day? He opened up the drawer and took out the book. What was the book over there? The list of all the widows and the orphans that he feed every day. He write down any, every amount he gives them. He said, you see, you have this book of full of divrei Torah. I have this book. And it's growing every day. It becomes thicker and thicker. You understand? Rav Chaim said, at that time I didn't understand the point. But today, after many years, I know how much he was right. I thought my book is important. But his book is much more important. Rav Yonatan Eifshit says that in a Zohar it's written when the nation of Israel answer Amen on the blessing of Mechayeh HaMetim. When we daven Shmona Yisrael, Baruch Ata Hashem, Mechayeh HaMetim. When the Shliach Tzibur, what happened? The Kedusha begins, right? Nakedishach v'naharitzach. 
הקדוש ברוך הוא say, who of my children want something for me? Which one of my children want something good for me? The angels are coming and they bring in front of the chair of Hashem a person that rebuke the public. That's the answer of the angels. Hashem say, who from my children want the most for me? Wants to make me happy. The angels go and bring the picture of all the people that rebuke the public. Just them, no one else. They are the ones who want the best for Hashem. Why? They want to save his children from <laughs> annihilation, from uh, eternal death, from eternal separation from Hashem. So who wants more for Hashem? Who? So why the question that Hashem asks is in Birkat Mechaye Ametim? Baruch Atah Hashem, reviving the dead. Why over there? That's the question that Hashem asked. There is announcement in the court of heaven. Why? Because someone who makes another Jew Baal Tshuva, it's reviving the dead. Because secular people are 100% death in the eyes of Hashem. And bringing him back to connection with his creator, that's reviving of the dead. Where does it say it? In the Tanakh, who knows the source. You can say nice things, that makes a lot of sense, but you need a source. In the book of Ezekiel, Chai Hashem, I swear on my name, Hashem say, that I'm not interested to kill the dead. I'm interested that he will repent, that he should live. From here we see that someone who is not repenting and is secular, Hashem calls him dead. I'm not interested to execute the dead. The Mechalel Shabbat is already disconnected from me. He's dead already. Spiritually, he's dead. I'm interested that he should repent, that his soul will revive. It's clearly in the book of Yechezkel, the prophet. I will finish with a story. You know, before the, the world war, the first world war, there were two empires, Russia and Germany. In Russia, the government was very strict, ruling the economy, you know, keeping the value of the gold low, forcing the gold to stay low, cheap. But in Germany, it was free market. The gold was uh, cost a lot more than in Russia, right? But the government of Russia, of Germany, made big taxes on import, right? So, from the silk, if you import silk, from the East, it was much more expensive. One Jew found a way to make a living. He was buying gold in Russia for very cheap price, filling up his suitcase, crossing the border to Germany, right? Selling the gold 10 times higher over there than Russia, filling up his suitcase with silk in Germany, and coming back to Russia and sell it for 10 times more. Great round trip. Not like today, you want to fly to Israel, $3,500 a ticket. They rip us off, these airlines. They know everybody wants vacation, summer vacation. They find out the weeks that everybody has off and they make the price four times higher. I always say if it was up to me, I would make a law. All airlines have to pick a number, average, of all year, and that's their fixed price for the entire year. There's no such thing, season on, off, price. You don't lose, make an average. Sometimes you sell a ticket to Israel for $750, now you're selling it for $3,500, more than four times more. No, sell it in the middle, I don't know, $1,400, something, all year around. 
like this, how much headache you're going to save people. Nobody will have to waste hours on comparing and looking and this and that. Everything, fixed price, by the law, end of story. Why? They can't take advantage on you. It's not fair. They let, they let them put a gun to your head and rob you. Someone has a funeral or something to go now to Israel with his children. He needs a mortgage. Imagine five, six people multiplied by $3,500 a ticket. More than $20,000 just to go for one day and come back. Such a rip-off. Crazy rip-off. Why? They do whatever they want. Is it fair that one person will fly one week before for $750 and two weeks later for $3,500? Just because it's a vacation that everybody has, I don't know, Fourth and July weekend, whatever it is, or summer vacation, it's not fair. Well, who cares about fair? In other things, they make rules. There are certain rules that they cannot go over certain prices. They make rules against monopoly, that big companies cannot buy many other companies, they, have, they break their power, they make rules. Why? To help competition. For whatever reason, when it comes to airline, they let them rob us day and night, day after day, night after night. They do whatever they want. What would we do if they're going to make, they see there's a high demand, there's a lot of emergency, they're going to decide to charge $10,000. What are you going to do? $10,000 a ticket. 500 people on a flight, $10,000 a person, and we all get uh, bankrupt while they're making millions on a flight. Why? Someone has to put an end to it. But that's besides the point. Anyway, so now this Jew is filling up the suitcase with gold in Russia, which is very cheap, selling it 10 times more in Germany, filling, filling up the suitcase with silk, coming back to, Germany, to Russia and sell the silk for 10 times more. One time, as he coming to cross the border by the forest, illegally, back then it was still possible, to cross the borders without, you know, securities, camera, fences. As he crossed the, board, the, the border by the forest, what happened? The suitcase is full of heavy gold, very heavy. And he carried it like this, another step and another step. All of a sudden, someone on a horse, good day to you, sir. Hey, look. Uh, a <laughs> policeman. The police knew they are smugglers. So they have uh, horses there, you know. You see, a, a policeman, good day to you also. Where are you heading? To visit my sister in that town across the border. Oh, you have the general road. Why would you rather come from the forest in such bad condition? The policeman asked. He said, I love the view, I love nature. I combine two things, a trip in nature and a journey to visit my sister. <laughs> I love the birds, I see the rabbits, some butterflies, deer. I love it. It's an opportunity to see nature. You're right, the policeman agree. I also like you. You know, I don't like being lonely here. So Baruch Hashem, now I have a companion. We should walk together, me and you. The smuggler have no choice. He has to put a show. Oh, yeah, yeah, great idea. I also don't like to be alone. <laughs> As he's carrying the suitcase and the, and the guy on a horse, walking with patience next to him, and he's sweating from fear. Who knows if he's going to ask me what's in a suitcase. And it's so heavy, and the policeman enjoy on a horse. So now he's, he's already f exhausted. He has to rest. And the policeman is talking to him about this and about that and about politics. When finally they arrive to the village, here comes the nightmare to an end. Then the policeman say, please put down the suitcase and open it. <laughs> After going 10 miles, with, put it down and open it. What can he do? He opened the suitcase. 
and the policeman saw all the gold. He put handcuffs on him and took him to prison and took away all the gold. And he, got, he was furious, screaming. The policeman said, I don't understand why you're so angry. You do your job and I do my job. You're trying to smuggle, and my job is to catch the smugglers. Sometimes you succeeded and I failed. Now you failed and I succeeded. So why are you so angry? <laughs> he got even angrier now. He said, there's one thing you caught me. You already knew from the first moment you saw me that my suitcase is full of gold. Why did you not ask me right away to open the suitcase back then? We will get it over then. Why did you make me carry it 10 miles? At least you would carry it on a horse when you, come to, when you take me to jail. The suitcase will go on a horse. I wouldn't have to carry it. Am I your servant? The policeman asked him. Do I work for you? This is the story. That's the parable. Now, what are we learning from this story? Huh? Listen to this. The evil inclination, the Yetzirah, is for, you know, tempting the person to commit sins. Promising him that there's going to be a great profit from the sin. But we all know that nobody ever made any profit from a sin against Hashem. If you make your wealth without justice, you're going to lose it in half of your life. Meaning either you die young or the money would leave you. But one thing for sure will happen. You become a villain in the end. Meaning novelga, meaning exhausted and broken and finished mentally. And then in the end you have to get punished for that. So a person is only carrying the weight for the evil inclination as a servant. Thinking, oh I'm making so much profit. <laughs> That's exactly the story over here. The policeman is the Satan. The Jew in the story is us. And when the Satan is not telling us from the beginning you're going to lose in the end, he's hiding that fact. He's actually telling us, very good, smuggle, commit sins, you're going to be profitable. He waits for us until the end, and then he shows up in a trial and testify about all our scams. Then we will say to the Satan, I don't get it, you're so evil. Why didn't you tell on me from day one I would be caught first time and I'll never dare to steal again? Why you let me steal for 40 years with success and now you come with a list of all my crimes? Is that fair? What's going to be the answer of the Satan? Am I your babysitter? That's my job to save you from the sin? No. That's the opposite of my job. My job is to bury you as much as possible. And I do it with sweet candies. How the kidnappers catch the kids? By screaming and cursing them? No, they run away. Come, sweetie. Look what I got for you. Candy. You want ice cream? Chocolate? How is he going to go into the van? Right on. That's how the Satan is. Enjoy here. Get away here. Trick over there. Tomorrow, Bezrat Hashem, I'm going to speak about the next subject here. One is Isha Sota, and second is Birkat Kohanim. There's a big secret in Birkat Kohanim. You hear it every day, if you're Sfaradi. If you're Ashkenazi, you hear it from the Chazan. In Israel, everybody do Birkat Kohanim. Also the Ashkenazim, every day. So you heard it thousands of times, and most people don't understand what it means. They don't understand what it means. There's deep meaning into this. It's not general blessing. It's very specific. 
Every word has a big meaning here. Tomorrow, Bezrat Hashem. Also, there's a lot of uh, big question rising from the parasha of Isha Sota with the water and so many questions to be asked. We will try to clarify all these questions tomorrow, Bezrat Hashem, 8.15 in Brooklyn. Baruch Adonai Leolam. Amen and Amen. Rabbi Hanani, Amen. Akashia, Omer, Atsa, Gadosh Baruch Hu, Lezakot, Et Yisrael. Lefi Chach, Irbala, Em Torah, Mitzvot, Shneemar, Adonai.